So, I, uh, I was asked to talk on how to make uh, raised beds in <coughs> large containers, anything along those lines, into viable and productive um, <laughs> units. And so, why don't we hold for about two seconds <laughs> yeah. while people come Just, in? They're going to come in. I know. That's why it's, it's a, but it's a hard thing. Do you want to try and start on time and still finish on time? Um, it can get a little dicey. Can I ask um, you a question about... I'll, I'll engage you while we're waiting. That works. That's <laughs> good. We have time to... Um, are you going to be able to share about how to help increase the microbial life in there? That's what I'm talking about. That's awesome. Yeah. Because most people start off in the raised bed and they get started and it works great for the first year and then it goes downhill yeah. from there and you regret that you ever invested in it. Or process. you keep having to put new things in. You will always. Right. All right. So we're going to get to this through the, through the um, program. But a raised bed in a container is a completely unnatural event. And if you think it's anything other than that, you need to completely reevaluate what the heck you're doing. Okay? These are completely man made events. Okay? They are entirely at your decision tree, not at the natural world's decision tree. Okay? So, just to start with that premise. So, I got asked to do this because I have a very, very, very diverse background. Um, and for most of you, I will be the enemy in the room in that I am actually a landscaper by trade, and that is how I earn my living. I also have a farm. <laughs> so I have a farm, I have a farm garden landscape business, we have a dairy goat herd, which I had to bag the milk last night. Um, we have ducks. You can't really see these, but this is one set of raised beds, there's another set of raised beds there, and I have other big um, raised beds called hula cultures, which I'm going to introduce you to. Now, um, I've also worked, I work with horticultural therapy, so I work at Perkins School of the Blind. I have worked at um, a low-income senior housing um, or uh, nursing home, and I have aging clients. So I have an extremely diverse background in um, how and where I grow plants. And I can basically grow plants pretty much anywhere I need to grow them. But I had to learn some hard lessons along the line. And so hopefully that's what I'm going to walk you through. Um, I find myself massively distracted and restricted by PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm restricted in space, so I'm going to see what I can do here. Uh, we'll see what happens. Okay. So one of the things I want to make sure that you think about um, is they can solve a huge number of problems. For all the fact that it's so much about all the problems that you can have, they can solve a huge amount of problems. They can go anywhere. You can put them anywhere. You can put them on concrete. You can put them on lead-based soils. You can put them in the middle of a roof. You can put them in the middle of a lawn. You can do anything you need to to get them up for any reason whatsoever. Okay? So I personally spent a huge amount of my life, one way or another, working with things that are up above the ground. Okay? Now, one of the things that gets missed a lot of times, especially in a group like this, where everybody here, I'm pretty sure, is interested in vegetables first, foremost, and forever, correct? Of course you do. Okay. If you're not, then you are like me, an anomaly at this event. All right? Now, most of you are also sort of very much in supporting pollinators. You know, a few butterflies wouldn't go and miss, but you're here for the vegetables. Okay, I'm here to tell you that especially if you're doing raised beds and they're in any kind of an urban, suburban, or even in a rural setting where they're close to your house, they have to look good. Because if they don't look good, you won't go out to them. If you don't go out to them, you are going to kill them, and at which point all of the, everything you try is totally useless. Okay? So have them look good. Now my point is, both of these um, demonstrate fruits and veggies. Can you get, I find looking backwards like this miserable. Oh, that wasn't what I wanted to do. That is, okay. That's kale. That's an nasturtium. Those are basil. This is a big tomato plant. Okay, you can't tell, but they're there. I don't take great pictures. Okay? That, everybody should get, is chard. Okay, but it's rainbow chard. Now, this is, so the one on the right side is Perkins School for the Blind. This is one of my client sites. So this client um, <coughs> had a stroke and she had a huge, huge, huge deck. And she was not going to be going out to garden anymore. So we put everything up in the pots. And we had production coming off of this set. 
until late September. Okay, you can really work with this stuff. Now, there's a bunch of different things you need to have. I can't stand doing this. <laughs> I think I'm still within range of that thing. Okay. There are lots of things you need to understand, most of which, if you've been here at the conference, you've already had a chance to figure out. What I'm going to concentrate on is the first four, because these are actually, in my worldview, the most critical things that you need to get a handle on. The rest of it, John Kemp will talk about, Brian Harrow will talk about, Mike Phillips will talk about, they'll all talk about. So you can go talk to them, listen to them. All right? I'm going to walk you through these things. Okay, I can move at this. So, observe, remember, compare. What I'm going to give you first is a mental project. Most people don't take the time to slow down and really, really see what their gardens are telling them. Okay, I deal with this all the time with my clients, but I've also dealt with enough other situations to know people don't really see. Now, the only way you're going to be able to learn from that is to compare what you saw today with what you saw yesterday, with what you saw the week before, and you will see a progression or a degression either way, but you should be able to tell that there is at least a change. All right, so the first thing you need to do is look for changes. Because if you can't see a change, then you can't interrupt the change, good or bad. You can't support a good change, and you can't interrupt a bad change. So the first thing you have to do is figure out how to observe it. You have to really see a plant, an animal, a human, take a pick, in its reality, where it is right now, if you think you want to interact with it. If you can't, all you're doing is putting your own screens in place. And that's great. You say, oh, I want a tomato plant. Well, the tomato plant may not actually be really happy with being there, but you still want a tomato plant. Well, if that's true, you'd best be understanding what it means to be a tomato plant <laughs> and that why it might not be happy with where you set it. Okay? Because you can only interfere and support or fix if you understand. Okay? Yeah, I know it sounds like a philosophy class at the moment. Um, on the other hand, I teach a lot of kids, or kids, to me, they're kids. They used to be young adults. <laughs> they still are young adults, I'm just getting older. Um, and it's amazing how much they can't see. <coughs> it's truly amazing what they can't see. Little kids actually can see a lot more. All right, it all begins in the beginning. I tend to work off of books. So what I'm going to do is hand around, I have 14 books with me out of about 500. Um, I'm gonna hand them around so that you can take a look at some of the resources you might want to look at. I'm not trying to support book sales. What I am trying to do is get you to look at different ways of looking at information, okay? Um, so you're gonna see weird and funky things like Herb Garden Design versus Earth User's Guide to Permaculture, two of my most favorite books, okay? And then Street Farm, which completely takes raised beds into a different world. So I'm gonna start by sending these around I'm going to start trying to keep my little wire here, so if I start walking here, that's why. I have a box up on the floor in the back, and whoever gets to the end of it, the box is on the other side. Okay. This is a crowd that doesn't really like to hear about design particularly, um, and that's okay. Hmm? Yay! Okay. So, yes, this is good. <laughs> um, Everybody thinks it sounds fancy, everybody thinks they don't need it, uh, especially in raised bed settings where you're putting in a really heavy permanent structure. Um, you need to have some thoughts about how you're putting this together. Now, if you already have existing beds that are wherever they are and however they are, fine, we're gonna learn to work with those too. But what I also want you to do is if you're thinking of installing them, that you give yourself a little bit of a chance to do it right, all right? So at the top is a whole bunch of stuff that you need to do so that you can listen to what your yard is telling you. How many of you think your yard has a story to tell you? Okay, I preset that one, I admit that. Your yard does have a story to tell you. Every square inch of land on this planet has been affected by human beings, not the least of which is the yard that you currently own and or are responsible for. So your yard has a story to tell you. And the only way that you can figure it out is to start to ask it questions. And essentially, this is a whole bunch of questions. And the reason I have pets and children and neighborhood issues up there is because they play a huge role. 
okay? If your kids are always bouncing basketballs into your raised beds, I guarantee you any corn you plant will become compost, okay? It, it's a, that's going to happen. You've got to take it into account, okay? The rest of this, the other books are good, and I do have them here, and I'll send them around. Um, I would say that the Earth User's Guide has the best decision tree of any book I have ever seen on how humans interact with land and how you make decisions. I had that in a different talk. I decided not to put the whole assessment in here. But if you get one book out of this group, get that one. If you get two books out of this, get the Earth Garden Design because it'll knock you out of your normal thinking patterns, um, which we're all pretty locked into. Okay. This is pretty much saying the same thing. I'm not gonna worry about the top part of it. Um, I'm going through this reasonably quickly. A, I have a fair amount of information. B, I figure what you guys really want is a Q&A at the end of it, um, where you can ask the specific questions of whatever is bugging you. The big thing is, raised beds have nothing whatsoever to do with farming. And farming has nothing to do with raised beds, other than the fact that you may or may not share cultivars of produce. That's it, okay? And they may be fundamentally different from one side of the yard to your other. Whereas a farm, you have a little bit more even keel on it, all right? Now, interestingly enough, Blue Bonesel, mm -hmm. um, was here last year? Yes. Yeah, two, two, whatever. Um, <laughs> sorry, that, I wasn't disregarding you, I was whatever year. Um, I've been doing this for a very long time, by the way. Um, for about 38 years, to be, to be precise. And I started off very conventionally in a garden center. And when I went out on my own, I bumped into some gardens that um, didn't respond to conventional at all. And I had to learn everything I'm about to walk you through um, by experimentation. And if I can get you to do anything, it's gonna to be to experiment. Because your yards, your sites, your raised beds are gonna be different from everybody else's in the room. It's the nature of the beast. Okay, I listened to Will Bonesell about 15 years ago, up in New Hampshire, before he became famous. And he's the one who gave me the whole concept that everybody gets hung up on the fact that raised beds are small. You know, you go and listen to these guys, 5,000 acres. What does 5,000 acres have to do with 32 square feet? Not a lot, a lot. Okay, he's the one who started the whole concept of, you got raised beds, you just average out the number of square feet, and all of a sudden it becomes a way to work with numbers. So this is a number slide, okay? Don't get hung on it. If you're anti-number, ignore it. If you aren't, adding all the numbers together allows you to begin to function with some of the information you're learning from some of the other presenters that are here, all right? So a 25-foot bed, four feet wide is 100 square feet. So it's a long, narrow snake. But all of a sudden it becomes 100 square feet. 100 square feet, you can factor out of 1,000 square feet. You can factor out of an acre. Does this make sense? Yeah. Okay. So he's got some really interesting stuff in his book um, about how to work numbers, but also some really interesting stuff on mulches, which we're going to get to too. And I wanted to note that, that the reason I'm crediting Garden Supply and DIY Network is it is so nice to see somebody else's absolutely immaculate gardens which have absolutely no relationship what to do with anything you're going to produce, okay? Those are, I will guarantee you, six inch pots grown out in a greenhouse stuck in a garden and taken a picture of, okay? Just to be clear, this is not what you're going to be growing, okay? I do have the DIY one in here because, like at Perkins School for the Blind, we do pull unders, we do pull along sides, we do um, uh, high and narrow trellises, wide trellises, Kids need, kids in that um, community need all sorts of different kinds of techniques to be able, for them to be able to access. It's a whole different thing. Horticultural therapy is its own thing. My point is, don't get stuck with a whiskey barrel. Nothing wrong with whiskey barrels, but that yeah. is not a whiskey barrel, and it grows great greens. We do all of our greens at Perkins School for the Blind in pull under beds. So the kids in the wheelchairs can come up, reach, and harvest, okay? So don't get stuck. Now, size and containers. Containers are different from raised beds, in my mind, okay? You need 14 inches or over. A whiskey barrel is 19 inches. Whiskey barrels are very nice and handy, okay? They're also expensive, okay? 
Um, this is a client who is into the high end of the world. So this is a, a nice welded basket with um, strawberries on the back side and color on the front. Very good. She gets the strawberries, but she doesn't have to look at them when we get the color on the front. I told you you wouldn't like everything when we would teach you. All right, Perkins is on the far right. This is one of our peppers <coughs> um, on our farm. And I don't know if you can see, that's a black nursery can. So I am a landscaper, so anytime I am planting any nursery stock that's coming in a big can, can it comes home with me. And it gets filled up with leftover um, medium, which we'll go into, and it grows peppers or eggplants the following year. And we get phenomenal production off of them, and they taste fantastic. Okay, we never do anything in ground for peppers and eggplants anymore. Okay, big trick. And I don't care, by the way, if you use a five gallon pail and, and blast out square holes and triangular holes in the bottom, and by the way, they're almost always triangular if you use a um, screwdriver. Uh, but you absolutely have to have drainage. This is absolutely critical if you are on a hard, resistant surface. Concrete, macadam, a roof, okay? You've got to have drainage underneath, which may mean that you're actually creating a, a U drainage underneath your wooden beds. You can do wooden beds. I'll show you um, Perkins School for Mine inside, and those are on concrete, and they have hoops where water can escape. Water has to be able to get out. All right. This is where a lot of people make a bunch of mistakes. If you've already got them in place, don't worry, you just need to learn to work with it. Okay. A lot of people don't think about how they orient a bed. You need to think about orienting your beds north to south, not east to west. Where does the sun come up? That's one thing about this group, at least it'll tell me that. <laughs> you will not believe how many times I've done that in a group and everybody sits there. Okay? Sun comes up in the east, sets in the west. Sounds really basic, okay? If your bed is running east to west, you have a hot side and you have a cold side. You have a drought side, you have a sluggish side, okay? If they're running north to south, you will get sun traversing. You'll still have a slightly cooler side to the east and a slightly <coughs> warmer side to the west, but as a general rule, the bed stays stable, okay? So think about it. And if you do have them running um, east to west, then you're going to have to run your irrigation on your south edge. And you're gonna to have to change and adapt the plant material, okay? Now, same thing happens in the container. You don't have much choice in the way of that because the containers around the bend. The side facing the south is always going to be hotter and always going to be drier. Okay? Put your drainage on the north side. Okay? If it's draining on the side where the sun hits the most, you may exacerbate your water movement issues. If you drain from the back and you're on a hot surface, you have a chance. All right? Couple of other things about drainage. You need to make sure if you're in anything whiskey barrel size or higher, and you're outside, that you have drill holes up from the ridge at the base. So, let me go back. See these whiskey barrels over on the side over here? Okay, every one of them is sitting on grass. Okay, that means it drains, right? Yeah, it's a hooked question. Okay. When you get the kind of, how many of you are from the Northeast? Yeah, what have you found about our lovely fall? Unrelenting rain, okay? And if you don't have the, so right now what's happening, all of these are seized and, and sealed underneath. So there's no water coming up the drawing holes at the bottom of the whiskey barrel. So you have to have drill holes up about an inch. And if you look at a whiskey barrel, you'll find that there's a band at the bottom and then there's a gap, and then there's a band, okay? The double banded method. In between those gaps is where you put that second hole, okay? And especially if you know you have a problem where you're really dealing with a lot of baking sun, this is not one of those sites, you only put those secondary drain holes on the back side, on the north side, okay? These have them all the way around, honestly, because of a long involved story, but. It, you also need to adapt this information to fit your situation or the situation you're trying to manage. Okay? <coughs> There's management issues there. 
Um, okay, so here's the, the other thing. You do not have to engage the soil or the sub substructure underneath the bed. Okay, that's the coolest thing about them. What you do need to do is, if you are going to use the soil underneath, or at least potentially use the soil underneath, you need to test it. You need to test it for heavy metals. You need to test it for basic nutrition. All right, when we get to prepping the bed, I'll walk you through it, but if you're going to use it and not seal it off, then you have to know what you have, okay? So, these are just different views of containers. Um, my ever illustrious nursery cans, okay? These are seven gallon nursery cans. That's a um, cucumber over here. There's tomatoes, um, the pepper. This is a pepper. These are tomatoes. That's a cucumber, okay? Um, that's a lemon tree in a nicer pot because it, it stays together. These are different kinds of ornamental pots. That's kale, all right, in a synthetic clay. I am not a huge fan of regular clay, not for vegetables. They breathe out way the heck too much water and you will not stay on top of it. However, I like the look of clay, so synthetic clay works very nicely. Okay, <clears throat> and these are just straight old green um, large scale pots that I got from uh, Home Depot. Okay? Now, here's where we start how you build it from the ground up. So, we did a trial garden for, um, I run one of the chapter slash discussion groups, and I decided that um, it would be good to have some trial gardens in town. These are two raised beds that we built at our library, local library, so people can come, see them, check them out, ask questions. And these aren't the greatest pictures. I take lots of pictures. What I want to do, first and foremost, was tell you that A, we tested the soil underneath the beds. It's perfectly workable, okay? We amended the soil underneath the bed to match with that soil test. Then we flipped that soil upside down. I dug it six inches. I had, we had a whole crew, it was quite dead. Um, so we dug it with a regular spade, flipped it upside down with all the minerals it would take to do the first three inches. And then we reapplied the same level of minerals again on the top. I've now amended at full mineralization six inches at the bottom of what is going to be a 12 inch high bed. So I have now given myself an 18 inch final window, okay? We also got the soil test of this going in the bed. And there's another slide further on that really points to this, but you've got to test the loam you buy, okay? There are no rules and there are no regulations. <coughs> in a different talk, I show you a slide where there are man-made soils out there right now. They sound so good because somebody is actually taking the time to manufacture them. <coughs> Get them tested. I had one <coughs> tested with 10,000 parts per million calcium. Now, for those of you who've been hanging out for the last couple of days here, you'll know that that's a little skewed. Or you should know that's a little skewed. I hope you know it's a little skewed. Okay? 1,000, 1,500, you're in good working order. 10,000 parts per million calcium? There are reasons why that won't grow anything, okay? You need to know, so get it tested. So we have a numbers guy in this ground. <laughs> He's not actually in the picture at the moment. <clears throat> um, he had the greatest time in the world. He worked out everything we needed at every single level and we did exactly what he told us to do. <clears throat> and he had a great time doing it. What we did was build it every six inches. So remember I just told you, we put the level on the surface of the grass, flipped the grass, and put that same, so we've now amended the base. We came up six inches and amended six inches with minerals, all right? Then we did it again. Now, what you're also, you can't really see, again, my apologies for the pictures. The minerals are easy to understand. It was rock phosphate, it was green sand, it was, um, we had used gypsum. I have to go back and look at the list. We had a couple of micros in there too. But what you're also seeing is we added two 32 gallon barrels, so trash barrels, of rotted wood chips, rotting wood chip, into this <coughs> first six inch layer. And into the second one, we added two 32 gallon barrels of shredded leaves. So what I'm doing to the loam, <coughs> I'm adding a huge carbon load, okay? 
Now, in order to make that work, you have to add, see all this white? This is kind of weird, right? And, sorry, why am I doing that? See that? <laughs> okay, that is this. That is chicken feed. That, yes, is non-medicated layer mash, okay? And I don't care if you get organic or not. If you've got the money and you've got the access, get organic. If you don't, honestly, <laughs> that's blue seal, okay? I have a list over there where you can get some of the stuff I'm talking about, all right? And I will cheerfully tell you that since I am one of the local chapters, like I organize a lot of our minerals, um, I have a very good working relationship, a 20 year working relationship with um, my local Agway. But I, the reason I have tractor supply and hydroponic stores on here is, you, if you can't access what I'm telling you, then everything I'm telling you is totally useless, okay? You have to be able to walk out of this room, find the stuff, and play with it. Otherwise, this is just wasted air, all right? So that's how you hunt this stuff. And tractor supply is up there for a freaking good reason. <coughs> It's a national chain. Find another national chain. Because you can get, right now, chickens are so hot you can't put your hands on little suckers. Yeah. That means layer mash is so hot you can find it anywhere. <laughs> All right? I learned this trick, back to my landscaping days, I learned this trick on a $25 million estate which had mineral balances of the soil so far out of sight that it was impossible to manage. She wanted a rose garden, and she wanted it now, and she had the money for it. Um, and I went and did this huge batch of research on what it would take to kick a soil that was so completely out of skew into life enough to support roses by the end of the summer. That was my goal. Actually, it was the goal of three or four of us. I came up, believe it or not, with cornmeal to start with. But by the time you bought 25 pounds of straight cornmeal, hey, that's expensive. <laughs> so I went and talked to my Agway, and Lisa and I have an excellent relationship, and she said, you know, it sounds like layer mash to me. So we went and we got layer mash. And I will tell you, there are two pieces of information if you walk out of here and try nothing else after this. I want you to play with layer mash, and I want you to play with alfalfa meal. And if you can't find alfalfa meal, go to Tractor Supply, get the best quality alfalfa cubes you can get, soak them in the water, and work with the slurry. Okay. What the bacteria? What happens when you're using layer mash is you cause a huge, massive bacterial explosion. Okay, massive. You can screw this up. Do not plan to plant into anything that you have used layer mash in. You have to give it a minimum of six weeks. And I'm going to walk you through a winter mix at the end of this, which I use all the time. And I use this approach in the winter. We built these at the end of October. So they had all winter to sit there and cook. By the time we went to plant the next year, you would not believe the quality of soil we had. If you had seen the pile we started with, which was dead, and all of these pieces, we had pieces of leaf left, but they were pieces of leaf. I put 232 gallon barrels of leaves in there. There should be something. Shredded. Shredded. Sorry, you missed that one. Okay. So we build this and we build this. We rototill at that level. We rototill at this level. Okay. So you get the picture. Of yeah. Okay. So we rototill at this level, then at this level. Okay. Um, <laughs> and at this level. We then put on a layer of mulch. Now you would think that that is mulch. That is not for my money. That is building a bed. So this is now capped with about three inches of something called chop straw. Now, I don't care what you use. Chop straw at a library looks pretty, has tack in it, stays put, doesn't blow into the neighbor's yard, and sits there and looks very much like something's happening all winter long, which is precisely what you want if you're trying to do this kind of a game. I use chop straw a lot, all right, because it doesn't blow. Again, this is my landscaper coming through. Okay, if you are reworking a bed, especially if you're reworking a series of beds, one bed, I would just have you work the organic material. If you're doing a whole bunch of them, what I want you to do is, is again, go back to your site analysis and take a good look at, say you're doing 10 beds. 
And five were doing okay, not great, but okay. And five just junked out for the season. That's how you separate doing your soil test. You can't do soil tests for every single bed. You'll go broke. And more to the point, it doesn't matter. I know, anathema at this particular conference, but where everything is test, 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 test. And I think it's great. I love it. I, th I think it's fantastic. If you got the money for it, and that's good. You don't actually need it, especially for this sort of stuff. All right? So you get one set of tests. Find out where your baseline is. And the reason I'm having you do that is because of that one test for the man-made soil with the absolute horrific skew out on calcium. If I hadn't known that, I wouldn't have been able to manage that. So you may or may not have that kind of a really weird skew. You need to know that. All right, if you're starting from scratch, you just empty the whole freaking thing out and go back to what I just walked you through. If not, these two things are your best thing. So this is alfalfa cubes, tractor supply or anywhere else you can get them. Alfalfa cubes are alfalfa hay run through a pressurized machine, okay? And when you soak them in a barrel of warm water with molasses and soap, okay, you turn it into an incredibly nutrient-rich slurry. Do not let it sit for more than 24 hours or you will hate me and anybody who's in your neighborhood will hate you. And if anybody was in Michael Phillips' last thing, about his lovely little brood things that sat for seven to 10 days, do not try it with this. Okay, you will get the same results. <laughs> that man of the woods thing, okay? So you're going to take a 25 pound bag or 50 pound bag or however you're gonna get it of alfalfa pellets or um, cubes. You're gonna put it into a 32 gallon um, trash can. You are going to add a cup, cup and a half of soap can be dollar store soap. can also be yucca. Depends on you where your finances are. Yucca is by far the better thing to add. Yucca is by far the more expensive thing to add. Soap will work just fine. Okay, yeah. Liquid? liquid, good question. Very good question. Um, and you're going to add two cups of molasses. Now what you're doing is a couple of things. You're using the soap and the water, and then you're going to fill it up to the top. Okay, so by the way, figure out a place that's level. You really don't want this stuff sloshing over and spilling. <laughs> Do not use a trash barrel with wheels. <laughs> it sounds very good, but it doesn't work. Yeah? I apologize. Did you give us uh, the starting weight of alfalfa cubes? You can do 25 to 50 pounds. It depends on what you want. No, honestly, it, that one comes down to cost. Um, I use about 700 to 1,000 pounds of alfalfa meal a year. You really can't overdo it, mostly because cost will stop you. So. Um, if I was really do, redoing a really bad bed, say I had a 12-inch bed that um, I was going to redo, and I would take out half of it down to the 6-inch level, and I would, into that base, I would rototill the slurry, and another carbon source, whether it's shredded leaves or chopped straw, which isn't the best, but, you know, right now leaves could be kind of problematic because of the kind of weather pattern we've had lately around here. Um, uh, wood chip, anything into that base. And then I would bring the rest of it and add whatever minerals that you, if you've tested, that you need to add. Otherwise, I'm going to go after that a different way too. Um, and then I bring it up again and repeat. And that layer of alfalfa can be anything from a skin coat to a coat of about three quarters of an inch. And it takes more than you think on a four by eight bed to get a three quarter inch cover. I'd rather have you do it in two stages, too. If you're redoing a 12-inch bed, I'd rather have you, say you can only afford 25 pounds, okay? Ah, for easy sake, 50 pounds. Then I can give you 25 on either layer. So you take 50 pounds, and you can afford one bag, okay? So what you're going to do at that point is half of that would go in the first layer, half would go in the second layer, okay? I also use alfalfa meal, and honestly, um, one of those... Where is it? There's my alfalfa meal. I'm right in there. And that's because anytime I'm working with leaves, I'm adding, I'm adding alfalfa meal. But in the, you know, the reason I'm giving you the cubes is alfalfa meal is actually technically a chicken feed, um, but it's also incredibly hard to put your hands on. Um, Gardener Supply Catalog, no, Gardener, one of the mail orders has it. 
at five pounds of alfalfa meal for the same cost that I pay for 50. So be careful. And so I'm giving you the, the um, you can get alfalfa cubes anywhere because anybody with horses feeds it. How much molasses? Two cups to 32 gallons. How much soap? One and a half cups. By the way, put the soap in after you put the water in. <laughs> or you will learn the hard way and you won't make that mistake again. <laughs> Okay, so here's the thing. It's a good question. And it's a sort of the same answer I'm going to give you for why I don't care whether I use a Blue Seal um, uh, layer mash. Yes, is GMO alfalfa out there? Yes. Yes, are herbicides used on, on uh, alfalfa? Yes. Ditto for the layer mash. So this comes down to, again, your finances and your core philosophy. I'm an extraordinarily practical individual. And for me, in order to be able to make things affordable for clients and for other projects, I will use what I can get that I can afford because I'm going to kick the teeth out of the microbes. That's what this is all about. And the microbes can actually do the job for you. They will break down the stuff. When you add the layer mash, when you add the alfalfa meal, you are adding such an incredible microbial source, they have no choice but to activate. And when they do, it becomes a non-issue. I have never had a problem using the conventional stuff. In this crowd, yes, if you've got a biodynamic layer mash that you're willing to spend 50 bucks a bag for to feed to your soil, more power to you, okay? I'm all for it. I can't justify it, I don't. I come up with other ways to get at this, okay? Again, your call. Every one of you has your own personal um, model coming in here. Does that help? Yes, very helpful. Okay. Now, the reason I have more food for your garden, there we go, Ugh. I'll send these around this way. This is a book none of you will have seen, um, and it's, it's um, an old 50s, um, coming out of World War II, look at how do you, the, he was trying to get food into low-income areas. And in low-income areas, there are very often not places to put stuff in ground. So everything he did was in slat side raised up gardens. And what he did was come up with a whole series of formulas on the basic minerals that are needed on an annual basis in order to feed your plants, okay? He's one of the few people who's actually done it for this kind of an industry. Uh, my end, of whatever, the, the, the raised bed part of it, okay? Um, interestingly enough, I'll send it around after I've, um, oh, actually, it did go around, Street Farm. Yeah, Street Farm, they, that's, that's actually, um, because they're putting so many raised beds in, they're actually more into the um, Will Bonesell look of, if you're running, even if they're in four by, um, did anybody take the time when it was going around, probably not, to follow the little yellow tags in the Street Farm book? How, take a look at it afterwards if you want to. What you're going to see is um, a lot of these things were done in, you know, four by six t trugs, okay, that were lined up as far as the eye could see. Then that becomes an acre. You'd be stunned how fast that actually turns over into larger amounts. You handle that differently. I'm assuming most of you are not farming through raised beds. Actually, is anybody in here doing farming as in true, how, much, how many beds are you working with? Okay. The largest one that I'm working with is about a quarter acre, so roughly 10,000 square feet. So how many beds are in that space? Well, the, the 10,000 square foot, because we're coming down an incline, uh, so I did a type of terracing with the beds. Yep. And for accessibility, <coughs> I, mean, I, I would say that your, you know, your short side is 4 feet, roughly 48 inches. Yep. And they curve through the terrace as they view across the landscape. So at the widest point, I think I had about 30 Right, so you're starting to work into the Will Bonesell end of having to total up that amount of, of square footage to work different kinds of mineral levels in. I'm listening. Okay, so, but everybody else with smaller numbers is 
going to be able to use my cheater method. You can probably actually use the cheater method too, but it might be smarter for you to change the approach. So we'll see where this goes. Ask me at the end if it didn't make sense. Yeah, there is. Okay, because that's where you're going. All right. So one of the things I wanted to point out was, um, a, I thought you might be interested to see the silver gray in, in use this, not the finger. <laughs> okay. So this is at Perkins again, and this is how you can teach somebody who doesn't have um, great spatial awareness or ability to see how to find where to put the plants in. Okay, so I just thought you got a kick out of that. Also, this is successional planting. So um, this, I go in in August, and August is the time when the kids aren't there, so I can come in and do whatever I need to do and not have to fuss, which is great. I also do a lot of reset in August because Perkins School for the Blind is in Watertown, which is very close to Boston. So they can keep production going through November. So I come in in August and I get a whole lot of new stuff started so the kids can work with it September and October and early November. All right, so this is us doing resets. You can see this is one of the empty barrels where the cilantro was. Okay, that's what went into it. Okay, so again, this is just to keep you thinking about it as a vegetable garden perspective. Ah, yeah, that, by the way, is my ever so lovely nephew. Um, what I want to do is, can you see that? That is a cluster of bananas. All right, this is again at Perkins School for the Blind. This is a breadfruit, which you can't see, but nonetheless. What I want to do is tell you that this is their inside therapeutic greenhouse, and this is actually an annual productive um, banana cluster now. Okay, it's been going for about 13 years, and it gets remineralized and recarboned about every three years and then it can run on itself out, and the plants itself tell me when it's time, next summer, in August, I come in, and we remineralize, and I'm talking about it mineralizing because we add stone dust to these, and these actually look pretty good if you were to come in and, and take a look. Well, you can see the size on, you know, there's nothing wrong with that leaf, okay, if you were to see it up close, all right? And I put the book in here, if any, I won't bother handing that one around, but if you do get into this, we do, and I actually have some at home and with clients, we do kumquats, we do Meyer lemons, they're easy to do in containers, okay, we do pomegranates, um, we do limes, we've got, anyways, you don't need the whole list, the point is, tropicals are very easy to manage in good sized containers, okay? Another way to look at this, and actually, depending upon you may actually want to look at this if you're doing wider spaces. So that first picture I showed you of our farm. So I was a good doobie. I went out and I tested my soil. Okay, A, the farm's been in the family since some um, 1750s. B, not too many people in my background farmed it after they could not farm it. C, my mother left the farm to my sister and me. And my sister would actually be quite happy if we didn't do any of this. <laughs> but she's a good egg. She's taking care of everything while I'm here. Um, we tested. My pH came in at 5.3, okay, which is standard for, um, for New England, uh, not improved soils. And we had nothing. We had no calcium. We had no phosphorus. We had no potassium. They didn't even register. You know how when you get a soil test back, high, medium, low? We didn't even hit a low. I looked at that and said, I can't afford to do this. Then we had the 2008 ice storm, which some of you who are New in New England do know something about. We lost the canopy for every tree in the entire, entire property. Every single tree crashed. Okay, which left us with lots of firewood and a hellacious amount of other hell. So <laughs> I'm looking at the fact that I have goat manure, I have duck manure, I have horse manure, I have wood falling out of my ears, and I have absolutely no nutrition in my baseline soil. None, nothing. And this is what I came up with. So these beds have now been in play since 2009 when we started building them. So they've been going for a while. And this is the basic you know, um, so we start with the logs, you start with the different layers, da da da, da. there's stuff on the Google culture out there, feel free to ask questions at the end. What I wanted to do is show you, we, so this is a drought year. That was last year. That was a drought year, okay? 
This is a flood year, unrelenting, unremitting. It didn't stop raining. And I can't tell you how many squashes we got off this stupid bed. That, <laughs> that is, I grant you, I was in the process of already deciding to take them out. These are some Nanking cherries, which my sister decided she did not like the flavor of and they weren't staying. So yes, the trees are coming out, but now they really are because all they turned into was supports for the freaking squash. They literally grew up over and down. We actually harvested the squash out of the center of the, of the um, cherry. No, it wasn't. It was, it was hysterical. Um, so hugel culture beds, if you are in the right kind of setting, are definitely something to pursue. They are based on a huge, huge, huge carbon load. Yeah. Uh, hand in a small tractor, okay? No, this is not built with heavy equipment. Um, this is, um, Kathy's been to all of our, our uh, hookah culture days. For every time we did them, I made it into a, a learning event so people could come and they could experiment, they could see how to build them. And um, we would have basically 10 to 15 people at a time. Um, the last time, the last one we just built, um, we just built two others. And um, that was a bigger tractor, and that was scary. We're not doing that bigger tractor again. Um, so what I was trying to get at with these is, we're also talking about climate change at this conference a fair amount. OK, no question it's an issue. One of the reasons I love these beds, they buffer drought. They buffer flood. They buffer microbial interactions. They are built on a huge carbon load with a huge nutrient load at every single layer I added all the appropriate minerals in the different forms. So I have different forms of calcium. I have magnesium. I have phosphorus. I have green uh, potassium um, at the lower levels in the wood. And after that, we manage our animals at very high levels. So they are fed azomite. They are fed kelp. They are fed fertrels, um, nutrient minerals. And if anybody's doing goats, by the way, hit the fertrel stuff. Yeah. Yes. But on the other hand, we have problems with voles, moles, every kind of rodent known to man. I will not tell you how many I've drowned. I will not tell you how many I've snap trapped lately, um, which has absolutely nothing to do with the HK beds. Okay? So yes, it's a problem. Now, there's a couple of ways to go after that. One, you can support all of your native predators. Two, you can get a dog who has some basic smarts. Mine does not. He watched his rabbit went one way, and he went the other. It was one of those moments in time. Yes, it's like Jasper, get a grip. Um, you can, <laughs> you can also look at terriers. So w everybody at this point is being overwhelmed by mice, at least in the Northeast. Um, mice, voles. Uh, it's not moles, by the way, that's causing the problem. So one of the things we want to be careful about is who's the actual problem. You need to know who your actual pest is that you're trying to control. It isn't moles, it's voles. And you can tell moles push the soil up to the surface. Voles just run the tunnels. OK? So yes, is it a problem? Yes. But I will tell you, I lost all of our sorghum to the freaking squirrels before I lost some of my crop to the mice. So it, it's a problem. But get a terrier or get somebody. Who, terriers were bred to be ratters. I'm not kidding. You know, one of the things we need to start thinking about, hang on, Kathy. Um, one of the things we need to start thinking about is you've got a pest. So we have ducks. I saw you the picture at the front. We have ducks. Okay? We have ducks because we have a low, this doesn't look lit, but this is a lowland setting. This would never be allowed right now. But when you build in the 1700s, you have to build where water is because funny thing, you still need to drink in the middle of the winter. Okay? So we sit on a perched water table. Great. You know what a perched water table gives you in a flood year? <coughs> slugs like you have never seen. Well, I spent one year trying to kill all the slugs. Very ineffective. I sat down that winter and said, what the devil am I doing? I have a food source. So I went and figured out which animal would eat it, a duck, which breed would be the most aggressive, egg-laying ones. Oh, great. We tried six. And my sister fell in love with them. Thank God. Thank mm -mm. This is good. OK, she's happy. Um, turns out we now have a laying flock that actually pays for itself, which is astounding in this day and age of farming. OK? so. I'm not trying to make light of it because I have been fighting rodents the entire fall on every site I have too, okay? So reality, on three sites, the men in the household shoot them, okay? Um, and I've drowned them, I've baited them, I've snap trapped them. 
if we could handle having a terrier, I would bring in a terrier. We can't. They'll go, he'll, a terrier cannot <laughs> differentiate. It's going to go after everything, which includes the baby goats and it includes the ducks. So for us, a terrier is not an option. But a terrier is a very viable option. There are some of the big domestic cats. Go to a no-kill shelter that deals with the wild cat, you know, the, um, thank you, feral cats. Okay? Adopt one. They need a good home anyways. Feed them lightly. They will kill for you. Okay? It sounds funny, but it's a way of looking at things. So, yeah, it's been pretty freaking miserable. Yeah. That's what I wanted to say. I have two feral cats and my own half-feral cat that I adopted, keeping my property clean, because otherwise I did not have any stock plants. And one of my neighbors, um, I barter um, my goat milk for his tractor work, and so we have conversations about this sort of stuff, and he shoots anything squirrel size or bigger, and he has barn cats. And he is, loves his barn cats. His barn cats lay out three or four a night. He cleans them up, feeds them to the chickens. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Nice. Free protein, and the cat takes care of things. It's not a good answer because, yeah, there are rodents in these. But I've got to tell you, if I didn't have these, I'd still have the freaking rodents. They just wouldn't be living here. Um, they'd be in the greenhouse. They'd be in the, they are in the house. They are in the barn. Long involved answer, but that's reality. Okay. Here's going ahead and creating custom mixes. So now we start getting to some different kinds of stuff. So containers, not raised beds. Okay, remember, I, in my mind, I differentiate. Containers, so anything 20 inches, 24 inches and under. I make the mixes for them. All right? So on this sheet, this is a synthetic mix. Yes, anathema, I use a synthetic mix. Okay? It's a coconut-based mix. Um, it has a mycorrhizal inoculant in it. Um, I'm actually not really fond of the product, but it works. And this is a bark chip. Now, if you have a broken down wood chip, you can use that very well too, but you cannot use a fresh wood chip. So when you, how many people have really actually looked at wood chip? Okay, that's a lot fewer people than I was hoping for. Okay, wood chip. All right, you're looking for, there's wood shred, Okay, and that's when the, the line crews come through and they're doing their fast, single-bladed um, drums. They will end up with a bark shred. All right, useful stuff. Use it all the time. Not for this. Wood chip needs to be about this size. So it needs to be half-inch diameter or less. Okay, it's called a double-flailed drum. And what it does is it takes a piece, breaks it, and breaks it again, slices it again. All right. If you can get your hands on that, talk to your arborists in your local neighborhoods, okay? Get a load dropped. You can use the raw material of that, brand new, fresh, coated in alfalfa meal on the bottom of the raised bed, okay? You cannot use that raw material in a container of two feet or under. You have to let it decompose for at least a year. But once the white sheen that starts to move through it, which is the mycelium from the fungi, starts to show up, feel free, okay? So what I'm using is a three cubic foot amount of a woody product, and it needs to have drainage capacity. You notice I don't have leaves on the tarp. This is not a ground leaf thing. Ground leaves will disappear in a season. You want this to set itself and hold for at least two seasons before you have to rebuild this, okay? Now, over on this side over here, huh, there, all right, we've got it mixed. You can't really see, but it's a, it's a complete mix of this. Um, into that, I'm adding the minerals, and it's going to be a mix I'm going to show you how to make in a bit. And in this particular case, we added some extra calcium because of where these were going to go to. Um, sometimes you add the calcium, sometimes you don't. If you're doing tomatoes in a pot, you best be adding. Actually, tomatoes, um, any of your super heavy feeding uh, vegetable crops in pots absolutely need extra calcium in the mix, okay? Um, if you're doing a mixture of, of flowers with a pepper plant, probably not. So that's a juggling game. Right. Okay. So most of you listen to John Kemp at some point. I'm not going to go over that. Um, 
The point is, everything that's going to show up in your containers or anything else in your garden, for that matter, is determined by the plant's environment. So if you set the situation up right, the plant is going to respond to it. If you don't, the plant can only give what it's set to give. All right? Plants don't need us at all. In fact, they would most likely prefer us if we dropped off the side of the planet because they don't need us. We need them a whole lot more than they need us. So they adapt. If you plant a plant at the beginning of the season and you don't give it what it needs, it sits there and does not grow. And if it's really bad, it just melts quietly away and is gone from the scene. It's called dying, okay? Um, <laughs> plants do that a lot in response to humans. <laughs> Okay, And what you'll notice is there's a huge number of other plants that you don't consider desirable that are doing quite nicely around your yard. They're called weeds. Okay? Actually, they're not, but we call them weeds. My point is you determine. And in a raised bed, in a container, you determine. And you're the only one who does. It's not the plant. It's not the plant. Okay? Actually, let me go back. See the sign? In the middle there, it says, plants don't lie. They can't. A tomato can produce deep into the autumn through light frost and still taste great. And I proved it this year with my crowd. I had a um, orange perouche tomato, which we harvested the last tomatoes the third week in October, and they were still sweet. And my crowd was absolutely gobsmacked. It was fun. Okay? Or it can die from neglect and energy right after the first frost of fruits. And how many of you have lost a tomato plant? the end of July, beginning of August. If you don't raise your hands, you're lying, because that's when tomatoes die. For a whole raft of reasons, but that's when tomatoes die. Okay? Now, you're going to have heard this from everybody. I'm not going to spend tons and tons of time with it. Okay? Um, you need an inoculant. Go visit the people out there. There are inoculants for sale out there. But, oh, wrong thing. Oh, nuts. <coughs> Sorry, hitting the wrong buttons here. See this thing called the hydroponic stores? Okay, so you can buy, um, and uh, it's, they're, they're great things. Tanio, I love their products, okay? Um, John Kemp's company, Agrodynamics, I've used those. They're great. Get your hands on excellent news, all right? Numbers can be a problem. Most of your hydroponic stores, what are they growing? Thank you. Cannabis. Okay. Cannabis is the best thing that's happened to any of you in this room. Okay. Because the amount of money that is going into microbial stimulant resources is off the charts. Go and look at what's happening with Colorado State University. Okay. They are doing some really fascinating stuff. Funny thing, it's all available at your local hydroponics store. Okay. And I've had conversations with some of those people who are... Um, the, the reps for some of the micro people. And they are highly cognizant of the fact that their stuff applies to the great outdoor world too. So like Great White, which is Great White Shark um, Company, has an excellent microbe that is available in, ev they, in, they're in every really decent hydroponic store around. Okay? And they have, I've used it, and it works. So you, you can use the stuff that's here. That's great. You can, we, at the local chapter level, so uh, my crowd, we get microbes in a bulk, and we all take three or four tablespoons, whatever it is we think we need, okay? And we get some of the ones from this group. But if you can't get anything else, hit a hydro store, okay? It's usually around these days, kind of stunningly around. Okay, buy or grow the healthiest plant starts you can. And this sounds easy and isn't. Okay, back to your original question of do I use synthetics or... Um, do I worry about the GMO component on it? If it's a vegetable plant and I'm buying it, you, yes. Honestly, the GMO people don't give a flip about you guys. Um, as far as the seed, you're not going to get access to that seed because they're going to lock that all up with all sorts of laws. What you want to do is have the healthiest transplants you can find, whether they're grown conventionally or whether they're grown organically. Some of you are in areas where you have good people growing good quality organic seedlings, and the seedlings themselves are healthy. And this is nothing against organics, but I gotta tell you, I've seen some organic seedlings that I wouldn't give to a dog. Um, they are weak, they are yellow, they are, they are stunted, they are just, they're lousy plants. 
it's nothing against organics, it just means they weren't grown well. Just because it's organic doesn't mean it was grown well. Okay? What drives most people nuts in an audience like this is, I use a synthetic fertilizer in the greenhouse. It's a high mag fertilizer. I buffer it with humates and yuccas and kelp, but I use a synthetic high mag fertilizer. And I have hyper good quality seedlings. They never die when they go into my client sites. And I earn a living by planting and succeeding right away with my plants. My clients never worry about the fact that they're going to have to spend twice. Okay? So I want you guys to either learn to grow the best quality seedlings you can or get the best quality seedlings from wherever you can. And that is short, fat, deep, green, hairy <coughs> plants. Okay? If you're looking at a tomato that is 18 inches tall and less than, oh, I don't know, a pencil thick, you're looking at weeks and weeks and weeks in the ground before it can finally rediscover enough energy to think about right rooting individually to finally give you a fruit at the end of September. Okay, trade-offs. <laughs> so you want the healthiest plants you can find. Then, so I deal with having to buy a fair number of plants too. As soon as they come home, they get inoculated. They, they literally come off the tr uh, my truck, they go onto a specific set of benches, they get inoculated right then. Okay, I run it through a 50 gallon drum um, and they get all the nutrients that they need in that drum with their support. And then before they go out into the environment, they get hit again. Okay, so they get hit with microbes at every single stage. For everything I start, I start my seeds coated in inoculum. They are re-inoculated as they come off the seed tapes. Okay, the heat tapes that I run. And then they go into the same number three, regardless of whether I bought them or whether they've been on my site. So I keep the microbe re-inoculated. Anything in a container is going to get, lose its, uh, its microbes to stress. Yeah? Can you get this in inoculum? Now, can you? Yes. You can get very, very fine-tuned with this stuff. Talk to the cannabis people about this. Oh, my God. <laughs> I, one of the young men that I hired this year is a pothead. Um, and what he would do to his cannabis plants, I would not do to any plant personally. Um, but that's what they do. They are into manipulating in every single um, five-day window. And they do. And that's cool. And yeah. that's a game you can play. Yeah. And I can't afford to play it. Okay, so this is, if you read the story at the bottom here, I teach a bunch of classes in my local region, and this is the story I hear all the time. I'm also at my local farmer's market, and I become the person to go to to ask questions of every week, and this is the story I hear every week. Um, so this is what happens. You go out, you spend all this time and energy in May, because that's the time when you spend time in the garden. Good, you go out. Then... Ah, end of school comes. Everybody gets out of school, including the people who don't have ch still children in school. Everybody's mind goes on vacation at the end of July, uh, end of June, okay? At which point, your plants have only started to really, you're three weeks into the cycle at this point, four maybe, okay? And, ev and the plants are, they're trusting you. You've been babying them. They're, you're, they're doing great. You go away on a mental vacation or you go away on physical vacation, it doesn't really matter. And the next three weeks, which are critical to the plant's decision-making tree about what the heck it's going to do, you guys go away. And either the rains come or the droughts come, or something happens in between. And this is the story you get. You come home, and you start paying attention, and all of a sudden, there's not much there. And then, of course, it's all the plant's fault. That's what I like about this story. <laughs> okay? And actually, let me... Um, how many of you have seen this? Okay, at least a couple. This is A, a fun read, B, a lightweight read, and C, it points out a few things. His big thing is tomatoes, all right? I harp on tomatoes because at the farmer's market, every week from May on, I get asked questions about tomatoes. It's, happily, it's a crop I particularly like myself. Otherwise, I think I'd hate them. Because people, tomatoes, all right, you guys tell me, what's a tomato? Okay, that yes. That's not the problem. A tropical plant. It's a tropical plant 
and nine times out of 10, it's an indeterminate vine. If I tell you the words indeterminate vine, what does that tell you? It goes everywhere. It's in a constant growth pattern. Now, there are some determinants, but most of us don't do determinants, all right? Tomatoes are the hungriest plant you will ever grow, the most calcium-needing plant you will ever grow, the most annoying plant you will ever grow, because just about the time you think it's going to be just what you want on your dining room table, the chipmunks are going to eat them, okay, because they're the only place that you can get water in a super dry environment, or take the flip of it in a, in a flood year, you're going to have early or late blight. Does this sound familiar to anybody in the room? They are, except that what you really need at that point um, is you need to have the calcium in place. So they can run slightly acidic, and this is where pH does not equal calcium levels, because you're right, but the calcium had better be there or you're going to have blossom end rot on every single fruits that you got. So that's the, the, yeah, there's the tug of war, and that's true in blueberries, and that's true in a lot of plants. They all got to run in the slightly acid range, but they also have to have the calcium, or you are going to run into other problems. And that's where calcium sulfate, by the way, gypsum comes in, okay? And beware of dolomite, but we're not going there either. Where did I get to? Ah, this is it. Um, okay, so here's the other problem that happens. Um, again, the first paragraph should give you the basics. Everybody's pretty much got that one down. Most of you don't think of compaction in a raised bed. You all think of compaction in normal soil. What you don't see is that the exact same things that drive compaction in your regular world drive the compaction in the bed, OK? Um, to rototill or not to rototill, that is the question. Anything bigger than a 4 by 8 bed, rototill during installation and never rototill it again, or rototill it during rehabbing, because you will need to do it then. I wrote it to all of the whiskey barrels at Perkins School for the Blind. It's the only way to get the minerals deep enough to support what they want to do. Okay, I have a little mantis tiller. Um, if you guys don't know about the mantis tiller and you're doing a lot of raised beds, get the mantis tiller. M-A-N-T-I-S. It is, it will turn on a dime. It is, it will not give you a hard pan at the bottom. Um, I look, I, it's phenomenal for container management. Yeah. In anything bigger than that? Yes. What? A, you can rent a mantis. B, going back to the square foot. In anything bigger than a uh, whiskey barrel, you're, I do. Okay? In a whiskey barrel, again, time management becomes an issue for me. I got 45 whiskey barrels to do at Perkins. I can do, with that rototiller, I can do them all in about an hour and 10 minutes. If I'm doing them by hand, and I have had to do them by hand when the rototiller wouldn't start, it's three, three and a half hours. And that is a real issue. Again, I'm highly, probably brutally practical. Um, and I'm on sites that aren't mine. So yes, in your setting, you could definitely do it with a broad fork. I got no problems with that. I think it's great. I'm just, People want to use rototillers all the time. My way, where I'm talking to people, they all want to get out there and rototill their raised beds every year. <laughs> it's like, really? OK. Um, can't do that. I'm trying to get people to stop rototilling. The only thing I will do is the whiskey barrels. But you're not wrong. Yeah, I didn't mean broad fork. I just kind of put a time in your sleeping fork. It looks like a pitch fork, but with square times. And, and if it works for you and you can do it efficiently, go for it. Um, I can set one of my people up to do the whiskey barrels with the rototiller and still get other stuff done. If I have to teach somebody how to use one of those in a whiskey barrel, I'm still going to go back and redo them because I know they won't do them right. Again, trade off city. You're not wrong. I can drop that. Okay, and that's one reason I don't like the rototiller. And I can drop that mantis down to about 12 inches in a whiskey barrel. I can't in the ground, but I can do it in a whiskey barrel. So, um, and aeration is an interesting term. So thank you for bringing that up. And this is what I'm worried about. 
and this is why I don't like using, he's actually right. If you've got the time and you've got the right kind of tool, I'd much rather have you use a fork, even in a whiskey barrel, okay? Um, because you don't want, a, a rototill is gonna actually put more air in than your forking will, and the forking is actually kinder, much kinder to your microbial populations. Again, I've got other things that feed through this, and I still need to be able to pull something out at the other end. All right, so he's right. If you've got the time, use the forks, okay? All right, this is pretty straightforward. Any of the above means your carbon levels fall and microbial life, especially the fungi, cease to function. What happens is when you dump too much oxygen in, all right, which is why new beds work so well the first year, you dump a lot of oxygen in, and actually everybody in the room should know, what happens? Why? Yes, that's true, but what happens? <laughs> Who said it? Of course. Yes, what's happening is when you drop a lot of oxygen in, your bacteria explode. This is great. If you've provided them all the food they need, then they can explode, and what you get is good trapped minerals that become available. You get soil structure. But if you crank them with oxygen and you don't support them and there's not enough information or information, minerals in that soil to support them, they burn out what exists, the carbon, the organic matter. And then as that organic matter is taken out, everything freezes and tightens. And as soon as it does, you don't have root penetration, you don't have air penetration, you don't have water penetration you've got compacted soil, all right? So compaction is what is doing most of these raised beds in. And I'm gonna go through these pretty fast. Yo, drumming water. Uh, which, by the way, anybody in the Northeast at the moment, so that those raised beds I showed you that we made at the library, up through August, I was thrilled with how they had managed the season so far. And then September came, and October came, and we drowned. And you could, even with all the supports in place in that bed, the bed started to tighten. So I'm going to have to step in a year earlier than I would normally plan to because of the weather conditions. So weather conditions are going to play through this game. So rain is self-explanatory. It just closes out the airspace. Anytime you're dealing with containers that are on anything other than ground, you are 100% without question or fail responsible for the water in that plant, period. You might get a little from, the, from any rainstorm. <sighs> okay, having said that, the fall we just had, you actually didn't need to water. But that's a very unusual series of fall events. That's why it's a record maker this year, okay? Generally, the plants come up and they create a canopy. When the rains come down, they shed to the outside of the canopy. In ground, this works, okay? Because your best feeder roots are out at the canopy edges. So rain comes down, hits the plant, runs to the edge. Great, the feeder roots are right there. All right, so, but in a container, it fell outside of the container. You are 100% responsible for the water in your beds, okay? Run irrigation. Be out there as, with a drink, I don't care, in your hand, with a watering wand in your other hand, I don't care. If you're going to do overhead irrigation, make sure you're running it just before dawn. We can talk about that later, okay? But that's an issue. Fungi are critical to long-term soil structure. If you're in an HK bed or a large wooden edged raised bed, you can really, really work with this. In the smaller stuff, you just forget about it. You'll get some colonization on a year, but you won't get much. It takes three years to repair the damage from a good road tilling or plowing on most of your good, good fungi. And you don't have the time for it, okay? Um, there hasn't been a whole lot of talk about the higher end of the microbes. We talk mostly about the fungi and the bacteria. The higher order of uh, microbes, the carnivores, maybe paramecium nematodes, um, or as Hillary would call it, the ciliates, they help to release the energy that's trapped in the fungi and in the bacteria. And they also get mangled with a lot of um, physical manipulation. We've been over this a little bit. Test your soil at the beginning. If you're doing a bunch of raised beds, know what the freaking heck you're putting into the bed at the beginning, all right? Add enough carbon sources at the beginning or rebuild the bed, putting the carbon sources at each level. All right? 
That's actually, as much as anything, the poorly developed soils at the beginning are the biggest problem. Out my way, there's, well, there are no legal dis definitions of loam. Anybody can call anything loam. How many of you think if it looks dark, it's good? Okay, I preset that one too. <laughs> um, just because it's dark, which does mean it has carbon, doesn't mean it's good. Okay, pond muck can be sold as loam. I've had it happen. I've had to deal with it on a site. That skewed out 10,000 10, parts per million loam was beautiful, dark stuff. Okay, just because it's dark doesn't mean it's good. Just because it's light doesn't mean it's bad. <coughs> Try not to buy sand. Try not to buy pottery clay. <laughs> Almost anything in between you can work with. Okay? I mentioned the pottery clay because one of the reasons I figured out a lot of this stuff, one of the first sites I ever had to work on um, was a site that was on an old pottery clay vein. And no, nobody, none of the conventional landscapers could make this woman's gardens work. So I got the job. And I knew the guy she was canning, and he was so happy to be canned, he told me what he'd been doing, which is everything I knew how to do to that point. So I had to figure out how to take this incredibly slicked clay and make it into something that will grow plants. Okay? So the best thing that can happen to you is to make a whole bunch of mistakes and figure it out, which is how I got to where I am. Okay? What? Do you... No, 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 no. I mean, uh, I mean, it's not this workshop. So bring it up at the end, okay? Because okay? th there are tricks to that too, um, but they don't actually apply to this <laughs> directly, okay? This is not the best picture when it's blown up. Can you see that there's a hook right there? All right. This is a restructure and a rebuild of a of a pool surround, and the garden itself. This was in its early days of me working on it had actually been out here, and then we had to completely revamp everything. What I wanted to do is show you that this is now three years in, and you can still see the improvement from the original bed in the turf. And what was really annoying was that would survive through everything that got thrown at it between the chlorine in the pool and the drought that hit and everything else. That little hook looked good the whole time. And the rest of the lawn, which hadn't had any of that stuff done to it, looked like crap. Um, so, Compaction exists through time, and lack of compaction exists through time. So compaction is a big deal. You need to get a handle on it. Okay, so everybody thinks that compost is the answer to compaction, okay? How many of you have gotten a chance to listen to Brian O'Hara? Eh, yay. Out of all the people here, he does the best job, bar none, of managing compost and mulches. So if you didn't get a chance to listen to him, when these things come out, and you can go up on the website and, and pull down the information, go and listen to him, okay? He has it down. You want to use his quality compost? I will shut up about compost, okay? It, everybody else, <laughs> compost done well, compost is black gold. Compost done poorly is it's pretty, you can put it on, it looks good. How many of you have noticed that when you put your compost on that it burns it down, not even by midsummer you're gone, you burn out everything that's in your compost? Okay, Com right, because it's a very active carbon source. And it's a good thing, but you have to have tons of it. So what you need to do is figure out either how to stabilize the compost and bring it up to the level of black gold, i.e. go listen to Brian O'Hara, or also figure out other things. So, these are things that we've already talked about. The one thing I haven't mentioned is you can get um, coarse hay and run it through a chipper shredder or a, um, a leaf shredder and get a very, very, very good soil amendment. It's fast. It will burn out in a year. But if you can't get anything else, you get a couple of old dales of somebody's good quality hay that they don't want anymore because it's dusty. You don't care about the dust, okay? You're gonna, and you can, worst comes to worst, you run it through a string trimmer in a barrel. Not my favorite way of doing it. The leaf shredder works better, but it does do the job. Now, interestingly enough, Brian O'Hara uses this exact same stuff, and he has this lovely little machine that he built for it. 
So if you are mechanically inclined and you would like to come up with a way to shred a bale of, hey, feel free, that my scene, I cannot do mechanical things at all. Um, Gesundheit. So anything you can get your hands on that's carbon, the denser the carbon. So leaves are fairly lightweight, right? Most of you have a picture in your head of what a shredded leaf looks like. And they're lightweight, and they're going to break down in a season. All right? Wood chip, you can, in your head, you can intuit that it's going to be heavier, correct? The denser and heavier the carbon, the more the nitrogen must be in play. And by nitrogen, I mean alfalfa. Don't put straight chemical fertilizer in there for the nitrogen. Okay? What I'm looking for is you need to come up with a way to support that initial breakdown of the lignans, and that's going to cause a need for nitrogen for the protein <coughs> in the bodies of the organisms. Can you see what's happening? And if you don't provide it, it'll strip them from everything else. Once you get the system cooking, doesn't matter. You'll be fine. It's getting the system cooking, which is why I highly recommend that you do some of this stuff in the fall, where you can give the whole winter time <coughs> to mellow it. This year it went out the window. But some of you maybe live in parts of the world where it didn't go out the window. Um, oh, and add purchase microbes every time the bed or the container gets stressed. Yeah? Do you have a cover crop with a, a CO2 or a microscope? Glad you brought it up. Two other people hit me with this when out in the, in the hallways. I don't cover crop, not in the raised beds. I'm not saying you shouldn't. The only thing you can do is to do it as an as a, um, OP kill you know, that you start in September and it will die off on its own. My issue with, and I have no, no problems at all with that, it's going to die off at about the same time my gardens die off anyways is my issue. So I manage my gardens to go as deep into the, I get paid, for starters, to do that. And so they are running all the way to the point where your cover crops are going to die anyways. And that is different. That's multi-cropping, and that's actually worth looking at. Because you can also do that with some of the kales and some of the other things. You can keep that going deep, deep, deep into the winter. You want to work on that game? Yeah, I'm all for it. That's actually not a cover crop. That's actually an edible crop or a production crop that is being taken deep into the fall. My issue with cover cropping, you're... Well, eventually it winter kills. It's just seal cheese, and, and the straw mitigates the temperature. Right. And it's still winter kills. Right. Right, so I think that's cool. Most people, when they think about cover cropping, and so, okay, I would dump into that that you could do a late crop of calendula, you could do a late crop of alyssum, um, you can do a late crop, crop of kale, and um, you can even do late sow spinach that might actually germinate first thing in the spring. There's all sorts of ways of working. That's actually a different... It's, you're, all right, you're right, and it's all living root systems that finally die. My problem with cover cropping is people, with the exception of the OP combo, which is grown as a, as a standard cover crop in people's minds, you and I are actually discussing plants that can grow deep into the season. And that's valid. My issue with cover cropping is most people see cover cropping as a till event. <coughs> I didn't say you did. I'm saying a lot of people do. And the last thing in the world I want is a winter rye application in a four by eight bed or a hugel culture bed that cannot be managed and eventually destroys the entire situation. That is why I never promote them. By all means, figure out late seeding. You can take some of these beds deep, deep, deep into the fall. A freshly made hugel culture bed, it will actually keep um, potatoes active all winter. I did the first time I did it. And it's like, uh, excuse me, you guys got to go sleep. And they didn't. Okay? I'm all for keeping active plant material going. I get caught in what people's perceptions of cover crops actually are. So that's my issue. Um, okay. Oh, <laughs> drat. <laughs> Wait, what? In the, in the HK beds, yeah, in the hookah culture bed. 
in the first year. Um, so I, I build my beds in the fall and then I plant in the spring. And I did not realize the time. I got to get to a couple of things here. Shoot. Um, oh, drat. Okay. Quickly, this is what happens when you get it right. You can see right in front of Lisa's hands, it's the transplant. Look at the size of the side shoot roots. This went through end of October and it tasted great until the diet day it died, okay? What I'm also gonna try and get you to do is leave all your roots in situ, okay? But dig up one for each variety and take a look at what the root system's doing. Hang on, I gotta get, I did not look at the time. That was my mistake. Um, okay, this is how you manage it. <laughs> so, high production of any kind, any kind at all, requires long season support. This is how you do it. Within six weeks of planting, remember that three and three I gave you at the beginning when we were talking? At the end of that s six weeks, if you are not supporting your plants in a container or in a raised bed, they will not support you. All right, the exception is the HK beds. Liquid fertilizer is needed every two weeks after the 4th of July and every week from the middle of August on if you want your best and highest quality plants and you want to be able to harvest deep into the fall. Again, this is normal 4x8 raised beds or containers. Again, not necessarily true for HK beds. Anytime there is drought or flood, reapply microbes. Anytime. Okay, we are going fast. Okay, that's late September and that's what I mean. And that's what I get paid to do, all right? That is kumquats at the Perkins, um, and they are at full production, all right? Mulches, you guys know. Soil drenches. Um, this is the soil drench I use. Um, I adjust it. I adapt it. I do different things depending upon what the plants are telling me. Um, okay, I just listened to Michael Phillips on foliar sprays. Totally feel free to look at his stuff. Can't wait to try it. I know I won't use it on most of my sites because it's too complex, but most of you are on your own home sites or own farm sites. Take a look at it, but I can tell you this. You can take that exact same liquid drench mix that is on this previous slide. You can dump it into a sprayer, hit the window just before dawn, and have very good results without having to get two sets of materials. Okay? After harvest, cut the plants off. Do not take the roots out. This is how I get away with the cover cropping. The reason we want the stuff there so any microbes left in the bed, so a, a winter kill micro um, cover crop thing, all we're trying to do is have enough root system in that bed for the microbes to stay somewhat viable through the winter so they can re-inoculate and restart the bed. Correct? Okay. Leave all your roots. Pull out one from each species so you know what you got. Leave the rest in there, okay? We did this in the, in the library in town, and I put a nice new fresh layer of straw over it so you can't really tell. It looks very pretty, okay? Ah, all right, spring mix. This is what they look like. We are definitely out of time, but what the heck? You guys can walk out if you need to. So I do two basic kinds of mix, and this is what they look like, okay? The spring mix. Any kind of paramagnetic high mineral clay. I don't care where you get it. Leonardo a biochar, a carbon, a strong, steady carbon source. I use North Country Organics ProGrow, which is not here. I don't care what kind of high quality organic blended fertilizer. This is a 534 high mineral mix from North Country Organics and two parts of alfalfa meal. I mix this up. I mix about 1,200 pounds of this a year. It goes everywhere with me. I do everything with it. It's a good, general, all-purpose mix, okay? Depending upon the site, I will add calcium depending upon the next slide, okay? Um, you need to figure out your plants. Tomatoes need a whole lot more than a kale plant does, which you probably will have figured out by now if you're in this room, okay? So you, you adjust it. By the way, I will go back in, especially at Perkins, where they need to be able to produce all the way through November, and I will re-fertilize with a granular in August on some of the plants. Okay, you don't need to see this. Winter mix. So winter mix, this is my liming mix. So this is what goes on this time of the year. This is how I deal with calcium. Everything I've learned, everybody can figure out their own way to do it. Calcium has to be tied into a carbon source, a carbon um, structure. Okay, so you can add molasses 
to lime. Have anybody tried to spread molasses and lime? It is not fun. Okay, <laughs> what we're doing here, where is, see this? There's your bacterial explosion. Look at this, okay? And I've got another fungi and bacteria food source. And all of this is going to be consumed by these two things and in the process held in place, ready for next year. You will be really surprised. I do this on a three-year basis on any of the, my in-ground beds and usually a three-year basis on my raised beds, but I let the plants tell me what's going on. Okay, this is how you do it, but we're going to skip right through that. Okay, again, this is a man-made event. None of the things we're talking about are natural. All right? You are responsible. See? You've got a lot of senses to bring to the table. Bring all of them. Okay? You need to be able to tell changes of color, changes of texture, changes in taste. Okay? Bring all of that. There is a kinesthetic sense that a healthy garden gives you. How many of you have walked into the best time in your garden and your shoulders roll back and your energy comes up because the energy of the plants is coming up to meet you? Most of you in this room have felt that. Not too many heads nodding. <laughs> Please tell me that you have at least felt it. Okay. You know when you walk into your garden and that doesn't happen. All right? Try and sense the day before that that's going to happen. You can get good enough to do it. They've talked about tools. There's tools here. Use them. But you actually are a walking tool. That didn't come out quite right. But nonetheless, <laughs> you've got a whole bunch of senses to bring to the table. Use them. OK? Um, this is just a point that's been going on for a long time. Um, I thought it was fascinating. I found this quote from this Roman poet. And then I got an almost repeat on a uh, blog I get. It's like, whoa, that's different. Anyways, we're not going to go into this. You've got it. Um, I have business cards up there if anybody wants them. If anybody has questions um, that we're not going to get, I'll get to these in a minute. But um, I don't mind if somebody emails me afterwards, because uh, I already had somebody ask me about that. Yeah? Okay, so he's in the middle of the room, and that's, that's a good resource. Trev, what? Six weeks. For, if you can't give it a winter, give it six weeks, but not much less than six weeks. Yes. Yeah, sorry. That's how you put, work it in. Okay, so do you want this slide or the one before? The one before. Yeah. Um, I think this is going to be um, posted to the, to the um, BFA website, the, uh, the whole program. Or email me and I'll just send you the slides. 